Hello, and welcome back to The Hatch. I'm Sammy Roth. I'm Rosie Murphy, and this is the podcast where we talk about Lost. We're watching Season 5, Episode 14, The Variable. It is a Daniel Faraday episode. It's also one of Sammy's all-time favorites. We have lots of questions for him. Uh, But after that, we will have the first part of our interview with Mark Pellegrino, who played Jacob. Yeah, and he, uh, you know, he doesn't show up on screen for a couple more episodes, but I actually think this episode is a good place to start discussing Jacob-related things, so uh, we will get into that. We start every episode of The Hatch with our hottest of takes about the episode in question. Rosie, what, uh, what do you got on the variable? What's your hot take? So this is maybe a relatively minor moment in the episode, but when in one of the flashbacks, Daniel is sort of seeing the discovery of fake Flight 815 on the ocean floor and Charles Woodmore comes to see him and, you know, asks him to go back to the island and says that it will heal Daniel. And it seems that it does. Right? I mean, whatever Daniel's experiencing here, he appears to have injured himself you know, in all of his time travel experiments, or at least that's what I assumed, he does appear to get his sort of memory back and his his self back. I mean, is yeah. this another instance of island healing? I mean, he certainly regains the ability to do, you know, advanced mathematics and physics. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it seems to be. That's interesting. It It actually seems to be. Right. I had not, I had completely forgotten about that. Yeah, I mean, obviously we see it with Locke that the island has the power to heal, and we see with uh, with Rose, you know, with Rose as well. And um, yeah, I know, just an interesting data point. Yeah. Um, anyway, Sammy, what is your hot take? Well, my hot take is is much less um, thoughtful and substantive than that. Um, I just wanted to to hone in on something that Eloise says. Um, in the very one of the early scenes of this episode, where we're getting the the aftermath of uh, of Ben shooting uh, Desmond and almost uh, killing Penny, Eloise goes up to Penny at the hospital and says, "I believe it's my son's fault that Desmond has been shot." And Penny asks, "Your son is Benjamin Linus?" Good Lord, no! And she says it in this really offended sounding way mm-hmm. like no my son is not benjamin linus like don't don't accuse me of that and and what i just find to be so funny about that is um one as we learn this episode eloise is like a really terrible person herself which is something that we're going to i'm sure spend some time discussing um but but two and more hilariously she's just spent like a significant period of time working closely with ben to get everyone <laughs> back to the island like <laughs> At the very least weeks, maybe months, they've been working closely together, and then she's accused of being his mother, and her response is, good lord, no. Um, That's funny. So I just, I just thought that was a, a low-key, pretty great diss of Ben. That is funny. Yeah. It deserved. Well-deserved diss. Mm-hmm. Anyway, yes, you, you said up top, this is one of my favorite episodes of Lost, and that's so true. I think this is a, I don't want to call it criminally underrated, because I don't actually know how most people rate it, but... You know, it doesn't get talked about like the constant or, you know, live together, die alone or, um, you know, through the looking glass. But I I think it's right up there. I think this is like a top five episode of Lost for me. Where do you want to start? Uh, Good question. Um, Well, you brought up Eloise. Maybe that's a good a good place since the arc of this episode is really the history of Eloise and Daniel's relationship that we find out was sort of doomed from the beginning. Eloise you know, at at some in 1977, killed Daniel, found out he was her son. And then I, I, I presume had to live all of Daniel's life knowing that. Well, not right? only not only knowing that, but but she seems to have structured her life around purposefully leading him to that moment of mm-hmm. her killing him. Right. Because she is the, you know, temporal police person, as we learn in flashes before your eyes and she seems to think it's her duty or somehow incumbent upon her to make sure that this awful thing happens that her son is led to his death at her own hands it's quite painful to watch yeah i mean she she says that to him in so many words a number of times right at the when he's a child you know she says i'm here to it's my job to keep you on her path on your path um which is you know, becoming this great physicist so that you can go to the island one day. Um, she's a complete jerk 
to his girlfriend, which stinks. Like, that's unnecessary. You can be, like, moderately nice uh, and still force your son to go to his death, I guess. No, you can't. That's completely <laughs> untrue. Um, <laughs> it's and not, then it's, it's, yeah. No, I mean, it's it's not untrue. I mean, she could have been. Um, I mean, what I, what I think is, I mean, there are so many things that are painful about it, but not only does she, you know, does she lead him into what she knows is coming, but she makes his life miserable in the process. Yeah. Like she prevents him from pursuing his passion for music, which, uh, you know, even though we, we learn in the flash sideways that perhaps he's not actually that good at the music thing, he certainly seems to be enjoying that lifestyle a lot more than his, uh, his physics work, but she, she yeah. takes that away from him. You know, she pretty much uses her, you know, her influence on him to steer him away from, you know, try to steer him away from any sort of happy relationship. I mean, the one, you know, we, the one we know about Teresa, like he's so dedicated to his physics being influenced by his mother that he mm -hmm. ends up testing his, you know, crazy time travel machine on her and, you know, leading, leading her to basically be, uh, you know, her mind is wrecked. She's a, yeah. yeah, exactly. As we, as we see back in, in the constant with, with Desmond, um, and and ultimately, even when you know, even when he's you know basically bedridden himself, and you know under the supervision of you know full time help, and unable to do any types of, of of you know mathematics anymore, she comes to him with that one last twist of the knife to get him to the island, and you know the question he asks her is, "Will it make you proud of me?" It's, I mean, exploitative doesn't, you know, do justice to it, but, but, but clearly she hasn't just led him along this path. She's, you know, railroaded him, you know, into this very, very, very narrow life that she believes he has to live to the point where all that's left of his fucked up mind at the end is the desire to make her proud, even after everything she's put him through. Like yeah. that's what she has done to his mind and to his psyche. So no, I mean, you were joking about it, but even if she felt like she really had to get him to the island in the end, did she have to do it that way? Like, I don't know, probably not. Probably yeah. didn't have to make him so miserable. Yeah, and it it does seem in that final conversation before Daniel accepts the, the Widmore job that she really doesn't want to do it, right? And she's aware of what she's doing. You can see a lot of pain in the actress Fanula Flanagan's face. Um you know, she she appears conflicted, but she does it anyway. So I don't know how much how much sort of credit we give her for that. And I think, you know, we've discussed this with Eloise before, but it seems like she felt like she had no choice. Like like you said, temporal policemen. Um, she knows from the beginning of Daniel's life that this is where it's going to end up, and whatever happened happened, which is is awful and you know if if we are to be generous to Eloise, which i do not necessarily think she deserves but she had to live daniel's whole life you know 30 years and change knowing that that sucks too and that's you know that's the island's doing or that's sort of she chooses to be complicit in this system and not to try to fight against it but you're nodding yeah, chooses to be complicit. I was I was thinking about that a lot. Um and I agree with you by the way, that's the generous interpretation which I don't know mm -hmm. if she deserves or not, but the the question that I had watching this episode is how how did she end up in this role? Mm. You know, did 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 Jacob come to her at some point and tell her, you know, it is on, you know, your shoulders to make sure that all of these things happen the way they were supposed to or the way they always happened? I don't think we get any indication of that, um right. but it's a possibility. But yeah, I'm, I'm definitely watching this and thinking like, even if even if she f truly believes that this is the way things were always going to happen and there's nothing that she can do about it, she's always going to end up killing her son. Why does she have to be the instrument by which that mm -hmm. comes about? Why you know why is she not capable? Even if she she doesn't feel she's capable of of fighting this order of events or stopping it from happening, what's to stop her from just sitting on the sidelines and hoping that it doesn't have to be that way? Or, or at the very least, sparing herself the culpability. Right. Because, I mean, she knows that, I mean, the way she experienced it, Daniel's last moments of life, 
you know, we're, we're experienced, we're, we're filled with the feeling of, oh shit, my mother this whole time was leading me to my death. That's why I'm dying right now. I mean, I can't think of a worse possible final thoughts to be going through Daniel's head. Why did, why did she have to make sure it happened exactly that way? I mean, we, from what we see in flashes before your eyes, when she's showing Desmond, you know, she points out the guy in the red shoes and mm-hmm. says, oh, that's interesting. Um, and then the, you know, the ladder or whatever falls and, and crushes him. And Desmond asks, why didn't you stop it? And she said, well, it doesn't matter. If I had stopped it, you know, today, something else would have right. happened tomorrow. It would have been hit by a car. It would have, you know, fallen off a bridge or, you know, whatever. What, what was to stop her from applying that attitude here? Even if she really, truly thought Daniel was destined for death, even if she thought he was destined for death at her hand and there was nothing she could do about it, why did she have to work so hard to bring it about in exactly this way? That, to me, is the cruelest and most sadistic part of it. Yeah, and it it speaks to this kind of of total and all-consuming faith in the island or the process or whatever that we've also talked about with John and with other characters. And if even this would not put her off from that, then nothing will. Right. Mm. I mean, this is, as you said, sort of one of the most upsetting things, you know, one can imagine. And knowing this, she, she seems to have chosen to adhere to the island plan, whatever it might be. You know, and and we can kind of make up the motive from there, I think, because she thinks it's the greater good, because she thinks it's important, because she thinks it's her destiny. Like, there could be all kinds of stuff going on there, but... No, I mean, I I think you're you're right to recognize that in that last final scene when she pushes him over the edge to take the trip to the island, which which is like the last thing that's going to, you know, ultimately that she can do to make sure that this goes down. Like, clearly she is feeling regret and difficulty mm-hmm. with it at that point, and maybe... Maybe when it's come down to it in the final moments when it's feeling more real than it did before and she's feeling some uncertainty. But she, but you said she still goes through with it. Doesn't stop her. Yeah. I think one, one parallel I want to bring in here, um, you know, I, I think this is a good moment to, to look at Daniel's monologue at the end, mm-hmm. um, which to me is one of the just most brilliant couple of minutes of, of Lost. It's, you know, two and a half minutes of pure gold with Jeremy Davies just like, turning pretty dense exposition into, you know, a totally captivating, um, you know, theory of, of how time and free will and destiny work. So I, I just love that scene, and I, I should put that out there up front. One thing I noticed in it this time that I hadn't really thought about previously, there's a part when he says, I've been spending so much time focused on the constants. I forgot about the variables. Do you know what the variables in these equations are, Jack? No. Us. We're the variables. People. We think, we reason, we make choices, we have free will. We can change our destiny. And I, like, did a double take when I heard him say that because it reminded me so strongly of what we're going to hear the man in black say to Jacob in the Mm. finale just in terms of the uh, sort of the opposite, sort of not, but just the structure of it. They come, they fight, they destroy, they corrupt. It always ends the same. We think, we reason, we make choices, we have free will. We can change our destiny. There's, there's something there, I think, and I have, I have some ideas about what it might be, but I just think that's too close a parallel to be coincidental. I think the same person wrote it. It's like when a president only has, you know, one highly reliable speech writer and they <laughs> all their speeches sort of sound the same, whether they're talking about like, no. you know, infrastructure or education or whatever. I think that was just the same writer, but I, fair enough. I mean, I, I, I just, I, I don't, I don't know about that. I, I'll, I should check to see who the writers were of these episodes, but I guess they have a writer's room. I guess what I, what I think, you know, so so often I was. This is a, you know we talk about fate versus free will, and that that's what this show is about. But it, it it seems like something a little different here. I mean, I think Daniel is saying, you know, we have the ability to make good choices and to try to help ourselves and to help others. Mm-hmm. And the man in black is saying, you know, it's not that he's saying we don't have free will, but he's basically saying we're only ever going to make bad choices. 
um, you know, they come, they fight, they destroy, they corrupt, it always ends the same. People are always going to choose the thing that leads to the most violence and death and destruction, and there's nothing you can do about that. Whereas Daniel is saying, no, like, we... we we have the ability to to change our destiny. We have we can we can. I, I think what to me the, impl- the the sort of underlying thing in his words is not just is not just we can make choices and we have free will, but we can actually try to better ourselves in our situation, which is what he's trying to do. He's trying to save Charlotte. He's trying to stop the plane from crashing. He's trying to stop Dharma from having to Chernobyl in this electromagnetic energy. I, I guess I and I know I'm trying really hard to make this work, but I. I, I I kind of think it does. I, I guess I'm just I'm reading something in here that there's a a duality that's not just fate versus free will, but is more about what kinds of choices are people capable of making. I don't think the duality here is so much between like, do people have the capacity for good or are they more prone to evil? I I don't know that I see a value judgment in Faraday's monologue at all i mean he says we have the power to change things and i'm going to detonate a hydrogen bomb so that oceanic 815 never crashes but i think the the rest of the season is going to be devoted to the question of whether or not that is a good thing and i think the show is sort of agnostic on the question of whether everybody would have been better off if the plane had never crashed um totally fair Totally fair. I don't know that Faraday thinks he's doing good here either. I think he's desperate and on the clock and, you know, realizes, seems to have had this breakthrough and wants to change these things because, yeah, I take that back because he thinks it's the right thing to do. I assume he wouldn't be doing it if he didn't. The man seems to have a moral compass, you know, but... Um, right, I think I think he's especially thinking about saving Charlotte throughout yes, all of this. Yes, for sure. And that's why he's asking to have the island evacuated and everything else. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not just about stopping the plane crash, but... But what thoughts do you have about the monologue at the end? Since it's it's my favorite scene, so I could talk about it for 20 minutes, but what, what did you think? I mean, Jeremy Davies is tremendous, obviously. <laughs> um, other than that... Um, I struggle a little bit with the explanation of, you know, I was so focused on the constants that I forgot about the variables because, you know, Daniel has been trying to convince everyone that the rules of the game are this, whatever happened, happened, whatever you do right now, you always did. And, you know, you might think you have choice, but that's sort of artificial. Whatever, whatever happened, happened, right? And, it's everyone around him who struggles with that idea and says, well, that doesn't make sense because the way I experience the world is that I, that I do make choices. Um, and I, I can change things. And instead of doing X in this moment, I'm going to do Y. And Daniel says, well, then that just means that you always did Y. Right. And, you know, it is, I think it is sort of a profound comment on, you know, the man of science coming to believe that we do, in fact, have an affect on the world um, that he's sort of defining in this scientific way. But that's how I it felt to me. That's fair. I mean, I don't think that negates when he says, I've been so focused on the constants. Like, right. yes, that is what he has been focused right. on, telling everyone that there are these constants. Right, right. And everyone um, else is just sort of coming around to that idea. Yeah, or they've, you know, it seems like some of the Dharma 1970s folks have come around to this over the last couple of years. Um, I don't know. I, one thing I loved is just when, I mean, when he says the line, I'm going to detonate a hydrogen bomb, Mm -hmm. which is a fantastic line, he he does this pause before saying it. And he's kind of like, and and it's the same thing right before he he says to Pierre Chang early in the episode, I'm from the future, Mm -hmm. where he does this pause and he kind of, you know, he does the thing where he moves his head around like Faraday does. And it's sort of like he's he's thinking about how to say this and then decides that the easiest way is just to say it. Yeah. Yeah. And he, but he also has this like little smile here before he says it. Like he, Mm. he knows how insane he sounds. Yes. But I I kind of also think that he, think that he loves that he's going to actually try this. As as sort of a scientist, I'm sure he does. Because if it yeah. works, it's <laughs> remarkable proof, right? Um, I mean, I don't know how he would 
sort of know if it worked, but if it works, it's it's yeah. proof of something. It's a big deal. Yeah. I mean, well, I tried really hard to convince you of my theory. I, I guess I just keep thinking now that the this sort of, you know, is this going to work, this experiment? Like, it's such a straightforward question. Like, either you can change the past. Or you can't. Or you can't. Either we have... I mean, and, and it's interesting because that, that was, you know, the question of do we have free will or is everything destined, you know, man of science, man of faith has been central to Lost even before we got into time travel, right? And time travel is, is just sort of like a particularly um, explicit manifestation of this where now that they're in the past, you know, playing out events that already happened, you know, do they have the free will to make choices that change those events or is everything literally destined because this already happened? I think it's, you know, it's a very explicit manifestation of a theme we've been dealing with. Right. But at the same time, it's just like either you either you can or you can't. Hmm. And ultimately what the season tells us, I think, is that you can't. Right. I agree. I mean, this stuff always happened. You know, Faraday was always going to die at Eloise's hand. Right. The incident was always what it is. Right. It was going to happen. The plane was going to crash. Like, literally, this this is not stuff that you can change. But at the same time, I just think, I guess I think it's important for us to to sort of think about that in the larger mosaic of questions that this show is asking about choice and free will and, mm -hmm. you know, people trying to do good versus do evil. Like, there, there's more to it than just the literal question of, you know, if you travel through time, is it possible to make right. things happen differently? Well, so I think maybe the more the way of framing that that feels a little more true to me is like, are you resisting this or are you enforcing it? Like, do you believe you have free will or not? Because, mm. you know, if we accept it's true that whatever happened happened and, you know, everybody always did what they do here, then... That doesn't mean they don't choose to do those things in the moment. It doesn't mean they're like animatrons that are being moved around in a dollhouse by the island. Like, Jack still chooses to sort of go through with Faraday's plan. Juliet still chooses to go back um, and help detonate the bomb rather than leaving on the sub. They they do all still choose these things. It's just that, and they, they just always made the choice like i don't think those two things are necessarily mutually exclusive but you have the people who are saying nah screw this idea i'm gonna try to act in this moment and then you have people like eloise who are saying i i know that you know i have knowledge of the way that these things work i have some insight into what the future is going to be like and my job is to make sure that those things happen the way that they do and to your point even if eloise had chosen maybe what would have been the side of good here, which is like the side of resistance to destiny. Destiny may still have won the day, but that maybe would have been a quote unquote good choice. Whereas she does, she's not an animatron either, right? She does choose, it seems, to go along with the idea, whether or not she believes that it would make any difference if she didn't. <laughs> um, you know, Daniel's been telling everybody this whole this whole season, it won't make a difference if you fight it and everybody still fights it and you know, does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. And I mean, I, I think sort of what you're saying is that even if it ultimately ends in roughly the same place that the choices we make along the way, you know, still, still matter somehow or still reflect something about us. Um, I mean, we can, we can choose how, yeah, that's really interesting. I wonder what, what, so why do the choices matter if it leads to the same place? I mean, why? I mean, I'm, I'm I'm pressing you on philosophy now. Like, if things are you know roughly destined, why does it matter to resist or to not resist? Well, because I think we we are the people that we are, and you know, I Jack. I mean, so Jack is an example of somebody who, when he arrives back in 1977 is like, excuse me, what? I am not going to intervene to save Ben's life. So that's that's a choice that he makes, and the choice is to do nothing, right? To to stay home and to not sort of act. And, and you know, I think we criticize Jack for that a little bit because it's a little bit out of character for him. 
Um, and yet, Kate and Juliet chose to intervene, and that led to the saving of Ben. So that little situation, that little microcosm that took place in Sawyer and Juliet's house, all of those people were still making choices. Jack makes the choice not to participate. Kate and Juliet make the choice to participate. That still says things about who they are. Let, let, let me try a slightly altered version yeah. of my of my original pitch to you here, because I think that what what you're saying is is resonating with me, and I, I think it's uh, perhaps uh, Im- improving upon and clarifying, you know, what how I felt while watching this. I mean, the the line that Faraday says is, "We think, we reason, we make choices, we have free will, we can change mm-hmm. our destiny." Um, mm-hmm. And and I really do think that. He doesn't just mean we have the free will to make shitty choices. I mean, I think he's talking about the free will to make to make good choices. And maybe in the context here, we're talking about we can change our destiny. I mean, he is talking about resisting the established order for yes. sure. I mean, he is talking about you know these we you know we think these terrible things are fated to happen. Well, maybe they're not so fated to happen because maybe you know maybe we can make choices that would prevent them or that would stop them. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I do think even, I, I feel more strongly now after hearing what you have to say that, that, that stands in, you know, some kind of contrast to they come, they fight, they destroy, they corrupt, it always ends the same. So I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think that the, perhaps the context for this conversation is the, the question of, you know, are we going to just go along with the established order and let, you know, the, the forces of, you know, the island or darkness or good or bad or whatever, you know, dictate how things are going to turn out or are we going to try to do something about that that might be better? Yeah. And I think Faraday saying we have the power to do something that might be better. Yeah. And some of this is the problem of knowing that... (laughs) time works this way, right? Like, nobody had this issue before the time travel started. It was just, in this particular moment, do I have free will, or does someone somewhere already know what's going to happen to me? Um, Does the island know what's going to happen to me? Is the island leading us toward some destiny? And, you know... Jack made choices in seasons one through four, believing that, well, until until later, um, believing that, no, that's bullshit. The island's not leading us anywhere. I have free will. John still made choices. Just because he believed that the island was leaving, leading him somewhere, he still, you know, chose to go bang on the hatch rather than help save Boone, he chose to sort of go into the sweat lodge and, and, and be led by the island or whatever. Um, it's not like he was just sitting on his hands the whole time. Just because he believed in destiny doesn't mean he wasn't making choices. He was just explaining them differently. And I think that's what I mean about like the whether or not to save Ben scene. All of the people in that cabin made choices. Um, just some of them chose like no i'm not going to i'm not going to try to save ben and some of them chose to say i'm going to try to save ben and this is this is a very like stoner interpretation and i apologize for that um it's, it's the idea sort of that time is not a fixed line right it's not a track on which a cart moves forward and backward it's more of like a um you know, something that it's a, it's a dimension, it's more like right? Jeremy it's something we move in and out of. Yeah, it's not. I think what Lost is saying is that that it kind of is that fixed cart on that linear path, right? Because ultimately, Faraday's wrong, and they can't, ch- they don't change the past. Um, but within the little cart, they are still having conversations, making choices within the cart. But the cart is going where it's going. Maybe you know where the cart is going, but are you going to be the person who helps the cart get there, or are you going to try to, you know, send the cart onto a different path? I mean, that's what this seems to be all about, right? Yeah, but that's not necessarily good or bad. And Eloise thinks that she is 
I guess we don't know this, but I assume that she thinks that she is doing good. She thinks she is I don't think she thinks she's doing good. I think she thinks she's enforcing the rules of time, even though she knows it's not good. Yeah, which I think... <sighs> I think she thinks that she's doing it for some sort of must-keep-the-universe-in-order sort of purpose, which I think she would say is altruistic. Like, she is making this horrible sacrifice so that sort of Earth stays on its axis and, like... You know, what Jacob says about if if the man in black were to get off the island, you know, all hell would break loose. Like, I think that is sort of what Eloise is enforcing. And you're going to say that that underlines your point, And I don't think that it does. But <laughs> I was I was going to say, I mean, you're right. I do think that. But I, I think specifically that even if she thinks what she's doing is altruistic, that she she exemplifies i'm i'm just digging you know just leaning into this here she exemplifies what the man in black is talking about when he says they come they fight they destroy they corrupt it always ends the same i i see that as being this very bleak view of human nature you know life is nasty brutish and short right i mean you know i, I think that what the man in black's point is ultimately to jacob is that people are always going to make you know poor self-interested choices that hurt other people and that lead to death and destruction and Jacob wants to prove that ultimately that's not the case. I think Eloise is a pretty good example for the man in black, the fact that she does not, you know, make any effort at all to resist this horrible outcome that she, you know, not, not only does she not resist it, she enforces it. She thinks it's her job to enforce it. I think that's pretty bad. Yeah, I mean, I think it's objectively bad. <laughs> um, but I think she, she thinks that she is playing... You know, she's playing this role of enforcer that needs to be played. Every, everyone who does bad things think they're, thinks they're doing it for a good reason. Sort of. I mean, unless you're like a psychopath. Not a good reason, but a reason. Let's ask our listeners to weigh in on this, because we could keep debating this for quite a while. <laughs> am I am I totally insane? Is there anything to this? Uh, who's... Who, uh, you know, do you do you think that Rosie's right that it's all about time travel and uh, you know can you change the past, fate versus free will, or or have I seen something else here that you agree with? Call us, leave us a hot take. Nine five four six Dharma is the number plus one. If you live outside the United States, you can also send us a Facebook message. I would like to quickly make a caveat, which is to say that. I think you make, I think there are parallels between Jacob and the man in black and particularly between like Jacob and Eloise and, you know, which we've talked about a lot. I just don't think that the writers were intending that when they wrote these two particular lines. That's all. Uh, I'm willing to, I'm willing to concede <laughs> that there are other interpretations of the two lines, even though I see them as connected, but I, I still think there's a larger point to be made by comparing them. Anyway, Rosie, I've kind of thrown us off the rails here with this conversation. What else in the variable do you want to discuss? Oh, I want to talk about how sad I am about Juliet and Sawyer. Oh, boy. I guess we have to do that. Yeah. It's... Speaking of people who have, like, accepted their fate, um, mm. it's just so clear that Juliet is resigned to a really sad outcome. Like, she's, like you know, very ready to flee Dharmaville and go back to the beach if that's what's required. And certainly doesn't seem excited about it, but also doesn't seem that stressed. Like, it's just like, okay, I guess I'll pack up and uh, we'll hit the road in five minutes. Like, you know, it's just another upheaval after like a decade of, of upheavals. And... You know, it does seem that her, her faith in Sawyer is fraying a little bit, which, you know, the show is still wants us to believe is because of Kate. Um, I know. Well, it, it, it's pretty transparent. I mean, it's right after Sawyer calls Kate freckles. Right, that Juliet tells her to come like, with them. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. I mean, it, it's definitely quite sad when Sawyer asks her, you still got my back, yeah. and Juliet's response is, you still got mine, question mark, and... And then the moment later when he, he holds out his hand to her, like, let's get going. And she just has this totally resigned look. And she yeah, she takes his hand, but it's like, she looks like she's just kind of playing out the string. Yeah. Which... I mean, the one saving grace for it for me is knowing that she is wrong and that this Kate thing is a, you know, a, a, a passing trifle and that these two are going to be, you know, destined 
destined, destined, destined uh, to to be together, uh, you know, in the afterlife. That that makes me feel a little better about it. Yeah, I mean, she is going to die in like three hours. Yeah, but but you're right. The afterlife, we got that. Yeah, I mean, they were. I mean, you know, they, their their love will endure. Is my mm-hmm. only point here. Yeah, like this isn't the end of their story. And it's nice to feel some comfort in that. Yeah. I guess that's why people believe in the afterlife. Well, not to drag us back down into Please. The, Please. the fiery pits of, of, you know, the destiny discussion, but you sort of repeated the word several times during that, that last bit. I did. To have free will and to live in a way that expresses free will, you have to believe that it has meaning and you have to believe that you can change things. Because if you don't believe that it has any result, then you will just, like, what's the point of doing anything? The feeling I expect I would have if that were the case is the feeling that I see Juliet displaying here, Mm. which is just sort of like, you know, I guess we're getting thrown out of Dharmaville. I guess we always got thrown out of Dharmaville. This sucks. What happens next is probably also going to suck. I I feel like part of sort of human nature requires us to believe that we can inflict, you know, affect some sort of change. Otherwise, you would just... I mean, and, and, you know, I'm going to go back to this well for just one second, and and then I I, I promise I'll try to move on. I mean, the man in black says it it always ends the same. And, uh, you know, I, I think that that is, you know a version of what we're discussing here, you know, nothing matters. It always ends the same, you know, pe- right. I mean, I mean, I think it depends on your frame of reference, right? So when I was like in fourth grade and I learned about motion for the, I have a vivid memory of learning about motion in science class. And the teacher had asked if you're sitting on a Ferris wheel, that's going round and round. Are you moving? And I remember having this realization that was like, well, it depends on where you're looking. If you're looking down at your hands, no, you're not moving. You're sitting perfectly still. If you're looking out there, you're moving pretty fast and it can be kind of scary. And I think that is a little bit what's happening here in in the, the difference that you're describing, like from Jacob's perspective or maybe even from Eloise's perspective, they're they're taking this very, very long view of history, right? And saying, like, in the Man in Black's case, like, they come, they fight, they destroy. That's been happening over and over. It's going to happen again. But for the people living that, for the people that Lost is about, the, you know, all the, the main cast of the show, the survivors of Oceanic 815, they don't exist in that frame of reference. They're down here. And they are living this, and it has enormous meaning to them because their frame of reference is one person's life. And, you know, Daniel, one of the weird things about Daniel is that he's sort of moving between those two worlds. Like, he does have this sense of, oh, my God, this is huge. This is, like, (laughs) these these challenges that I'm, I'm approaching are massive in scope and he has sort of a sense of that world, but is still also existing down here on sort of the human person to person level with you and me. And of course, as a person, you, you have to believe that you can change things. And that's the the difference I think between those two things. And that's what makes me think that they're not the same is that the man in black is, is on the frame of reference. That's outside Mm. the Ferris wheel and, and everyone else is on it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you, you you might very well be right here. And and one comment that makes me think that you're you're possibly more uh, more more on target than I am. I mean, Jacob is not exactly on the other side of this. He is also, I think, looking at this from a. I mean, his comment is it only ends once. Anything before that is just mm-hmm. progress. I mean, I think he's he's also sort of dismissive to these. You know, the, the stuff happening inside the the cart that you described. I mean, the individual mm-hmm. choices that are being made and how they affect you know, real people or how they reflect on real people. I mean, he sees them as, you know, progress towards what he would consider to be, you know, a positive and, and arguably predetermined ending of his own choosing. Right. Um, right. You know, rather than something that matters in and of itself. Right. And the the people like Eloise who choose to adopt that frame of reference 
come off as like hugely cold and calculating and disaffected because they've sort of chosen not to participate in these day-to-day affairs, right? They are taking that higher frame of reference, whereas, uh, you know, for Jack is the character who I think displays this most urgently, but like every decision is a huge decision because they're experiencing it here and now. And, you know, I, I, I don't think the existence of a destiny makes any of what happens in that mm. cart any less valuable, you know? I do. Maybe maybe more so than being oppositional to what the man in black has to say, maybe Daniel's attitude here is more oppositional to the entire Jacob versus the man in black framework. Hmm. I mean, both of them are trying to control people's lives and destinies to a certain extent, and Jacob maybe is always talking about people having choice and free will. He emphasizes that a lot in season six, but as I'm I'm sure we'll, you know, have discussed and will discuss. He's also trying to push people towards the choices he wants them to make. Right. And and spend um, indeed hard. their whole lives leading them toward those choices. Yeah, much much like Eloise, uh, who yeah. you put in the category with Jacob. So Yeah, interesting. Maybe maybe part of what's going on with Daniel's here is Daniel here is just, you know, you know, f- fuck you to all of that. I mean, yeah. what really matters is people and the choices we make rather than these outside forces. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and, and for Jacob to say, you have free will, but you have free will to make this precise decision within this set of circumstances that I have orchestrated very carefully. Like, is that free will? I don't That's for season six. We we should, um, I mean, there's a little more to discuss this episode, but maybe considering where we are in the conversation now, we should turn on Mark Pellegrino and, and let people hear what he has to say about all this. I agree with that. Um, we spoke with Mark uh, a few months ago. Um Delightful conversation. We won't set it up too much because it's great. We are here with Mark Pellegrino, who, of course, played Jacob on Lost, uh, a character that needs no introduction. Mark, thank you very, very much for being with us on The Hatch. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, let, let's start all the way back at the beginning, um, you know, with, with keeping in mind this was, uh, what, 11 or, or 12 years ago at this point. H- how did you get cast on Lost? Oh, so... <laughs> um... I had four auditions the the day that I was supposed to read for Lost. They were all dramatic auditions, and the Lost sides were seven pages long. And I turned to my wife and I said, I can't go up for this show. Um, It's just too many pages. I've got too much other stuff going on. I'm going to have to say no to this. She said, you better go in on this show because it's like the hottest show on television. And um, you, you... and I'm like, yes, I know this. This is why I'm not going to go in. I don't have time to prepare seven pages of material. And I'm not going to go in there and make a fool out of myself and screw it up. Uh, but she convinced me to go in anyway. And somehow I was able to uh, cobble together some rehearsal time on the piece and went in there and rehearsed, did it, you know, in front of them. And uh, didn't hear anything. For It was a good audition. It was really fun. Uh, it was the scene. It, it ended up being the scene between the man in black and Jacob on the beach more or Excellent. less a, a version of that, but you know, different names, of course. And, uh, and I, th- I thought it went very well and I didn't hear anything for three weeks. Then suddenly I did. Uh, yeah. They want you to, um, go up there and play this part. They didn't tell me the part though. I didn't know what the part was. My wife who was, who was, had been watching the show. Uh, she says, I bet I know what part you're going to play. And I hadn't, I hadn't watched the show, so I, was, I said, what, what part? Tell me. What part do you think I'm going to play? She says, I think you're going to play this part of this character called Jacob. I was like, huh. well, you know what? I didn't know anything about how secret this, the scripts were and all that, so I was like, well, that wasn't the, that wasn't the character that they gave me, and I don't know. And, and so I flew to, to Hawaii not knowing what I was going to play. I don't even remember if I had a copy of, of a full script at the time or not mm-hmm. yet. Um, but when I landed, I think I went to the set. Ju- I went to the, to go to wardrobe, and I think I had to go to the set to to meet the the person for wardrobe. And I believe Michael Emerson was like the first person I saw, and he's like, "Ah, you're our Jacob." And that's how I found out <laughs> oh, wow. that I was going to be Jacob. <laughs> and um, yeah, and so I'm glad I didn't know that beforehand because had I known, I think I would have been really nervous about going in there because the part was you know, carried the secrets of the island on his shoulders. Right. And, you know, he'd been built up, you know, for a while beforehand. There was so much anticipation, so much anticipation, in fact, that one of my f- students 
who also became a friend of uh, my wife and myself. A- a- acting um, student, presumably. Acting student, right. Yeah. Uh, she, she, was so, she was so into the show. And when she saw me come on as Jacob, she's like, oh, my God, Jacob's Mark Pellegrino. And she couldn't, but she couldn't get into it because she knew me as a, as a person. <laughs> and she had been waiting so long for Jacob. It sort of was like a buzzkill for her. Man. Oh, that's so, so you hadn't been watching the show yourself. Correct. Wow. I, I got to yeah. tell you, as, as a fan, just the way your character is introduced, like sort of with no warning whatsoever in the first sequence of the, you know, the finale of the, the penultimate season, it was, it was quite mind blowing. I mean, it's a, I, I assume you've seen it. It's a great, great sequence. Yeah, I love that. That that scene, that that reveal scene with me and the man in black, I think is really great because mm-hmm. they just drop it. They just drop it yeah. on you and you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. At what point were, did you find out that Jacob was this godlike figure uh, who carries, like you said, all the secrets of the island, who's been teased for three or four years? Um, how was that explained to you? It was never explained to me except... Uh, during one scene, I think I was with the young Kate in a scene and mm. Jack Bender, the director, producer, one of the executive producers of the show, saw something that I did. It was early on uh, mm. in the work and he saw what I did. and He's like, that's it. Jesus, the carpenter. That's the, that's it. And it just so happened that that idea really resonated with me as I, I was a former Christian and I got r- really into uh, the idea of Jesus the Carpenter and, and the Master and the Margarita in this very humble but you know all knowing accessible being and um, mm-hmm. it, it just really resonated with me. But that's the only note that I ever got with respect to Jacob. Is, and I worked that... with and I worked with Carlton Cuse later on in a, a show called The Return, and we never really talked about you know the dynamics too much. Huh. Well, I was going to wow. ask Rosie, you, you being our in-house uh, expert on all things Jesus and Christianity here, does that, <laughs> does that ring true to you? It's a, I mean, of course, there, there's so much, you know, light and dark duality of man stuff going on with Jacob and the man in black that it definitely tracks. I um, mean, I thought he was a quite a bit more flawed. I never envisioned Jesus yeah. the Carpenter as, you know, killing a brother or, you know, having those kind of emotional fissures that he had but you know and so so much um so many things tearing at him in different directions but uh i imagine jesus the carpenter is a a lot more solid but just accessible (laughs) yeah well that's interesting because one of the things that i and this is jumping a little bit ahead of ourselves here that i did want to ask you about i mean that the way they're you know presented at a surface level is you know jacob the light side and man in black the dark (laughs) side but obviously it's more nuanced than that and and you know, as we learn in the backstory, both characters have, you know, their their virtues and their flaws. I guess I'm just curious how, looking back, how how did you, like, understand, you know, the conflict between these characters or what was going on? Like, what what is an actor was in your head as you're thinking about, here's here's my here's my problem with this guy and, and what I'm really all about, um, you know, in this conflict? Well, I mean, I, I, I saw the conflict as between altruism and self-interest. It seemed like, you know, the man in black wanted to explore the world. He wanted to see. He wanted to know. He wanted he wanted to touch things. He, he, he And and Jacob had a, a, a larger, quote unquote, uh, purpose. You know, his, mm-hmm. he, his, his purpose um, he saw as as not about himself, but as, a, as about this wider sort of goal. And and I thought that was that was the main struggle between the two, where they where they had their differences. Was that Jacob felt that his life was more or less um, uh, how do I say it? More or less like a, a cog, a tool for this for mm. this wider purpose. And the man in black didn't seem to want that at all. Mm. And so that was the conflict between the two of them. You know what I what I like about that, besides from just it being more nuanced than just good versus evil, is I I, I rewatched Across the Sea last night, and I hadn't you know I've rewatched a lot of Lost. I'm a big fan, but that was an episode I hadn't watched probably since it aired, and I was a lot more sympathetic to the Man in Black than I I would have thought. I mean, his desire to just go and as you said, it's self interest. He wants to go live his life and see things and not be trapped there. I, I, I empathized with that, and and even though he was not a good man in a lot of ways, so I was watching it partly thinking, like, gee, does does Jacob really have to keep him here? Like, would it be that bad to to let him, you know, go somewhere else? Well, see, um, when I would listen to Titus say those things, 
I would think to myself, sounds like a noble aspiration to me. I have no problem with you leaving and, and doing your thing, but I have a very different moral orientation than, than Jacob had, you know? Yeah. And yet, I mean, it's not like they were raised in, in, in stability either. I mean, we saw the mother was a fanatic. I mean, from what I remember, um, it's, it's been so long. I, and I haven't revisited the episodes in a long time, but she was a fanatic and you have to imagine people growing oh, yeah, for sure. two poles growing up with it with, under mm-hmm. the umbrella of that fanaticism. One is going to be a con- convert and the other is going to be a rebel. And that's sort of the way it was, you know, the convert versus the rebel. Sort of like, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Frailty. You ever see the movie? No. Oh, man, no. you've got to see the movie Frailty. I'm a horror movie freak. So, uh, no, I, I avoid horror movies like the devil. No, no, but, but it's, it's, anyway. it's a good one. It's a, it's, I, don't, I, I avoid slasher horror movies. This is actually a good one with a killer twist. Matthew McConaughey's in it, Bill Paxton. It's about a guy who gets a vision from the archangel Michael, he thinks, right, that, mm-hmm. uh, that he has to go out and kill demons. And, but from the outside, he looks like a serial killer. And he's got two kids that he's taking with him on this. And one is a complete convert. And the other guy is like, what are you doing? These are human beings. You're, t- you're, and okay, of course, and you don't know what's true and what isn't. But you do see these two, the, the drama play out between the two brothers. And that's what I think the man in black, whose real name was Bruce. No, what was it, Bruce? Well, I forget his real name. We did a joke piece on it. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, and I think they made, they revealed his name as Bruce or something like that. Okay. Um, anyway, um, but that's the same dynamic I think between the man in black, the fanatic versus the rebel. That's really interesting. Yeah. What was it like working with uh, with Titus? Obviously, also a, a fantastic actor. So awful. So no, I'm joking. He's actually a really great. He's one of the one of the greatest dudes I know. And I know you hear everybody say that. Like, I, I, do you ever hear an actor talk shit about another actor? I don't know. I think usually they uh, just no. they just politely move on from the question if they don't. Right, right. Yeah. So you move on. You just, you're diplomatic. But Titus is a genuinely really great guy. We worked on a film together a, a couple a few years before before that one, and um, you know we. We'd spend our off times at P.F. Chang's drinking wine and he would uh, – <laughs> because P.F. Chang's was right down the street from us there in Waikiki and, and we, he would just regale me with stories. He's a great storyteller. He's a great mimic. He does some of the best Christopher Walken, Al Pacino impersonations. If you ever have him <laughs> on your show, he can do Al Pacino at all of his stages of life. It's brilliant. We got to get him uh, for season six, Rosie. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's, he is uh, – he's a card man and very talented. So – I loved working with him. I loved working with him. Yeah. yeah. You, you guys have, I mean, from that first moment on the beach, you have a great rapport. I mean, the, 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 the hatred that you can feel between these guys kind of sliced with, with a, almost a wit. It, it's, it's something. It's, I mean, it, it has a magnetic energy on the screen. Yeah, I think we had a real connection. You know, ironically, in that first scene, um, they, had him, they had him sitting with his back to me, and he's about 10 or 12 feet away from me, and I'm leaning against the log, and there's the fish... Mm-hmm fire in front of me and uh, I remember it was windy and the surf is crashing I could not hear a word he said so when he was talking to me he was more or less talking to himself and I had to watch when I thought he was done and respond to what I think he said and how I think he said it and I'm like an I'm a Meisner guy, so I like, I don't know if you know Meisner, but I like the, I like interacting with somebody and mm-hmm. hearing what they're saying and feeling what they're saying. So it was, it was really difficult to, for me <laughs> to do that because I couldn't hear anything he was saying. That's well, funny. you wouldn't, you wouldn't guess from watching the thing. Yeah. I, yeah, it turned out to be a good scene. I was like, I was surprised when I watched it. I'm like, wow, everything, it, it works out. Somehow the, con- yeah. the craziness of filmmaking congeals yeah. into something watchable. Yeah. You mentioned earlier meeting Michael Emerson, and of course the other big scene in that season five finale is when he kills you, yep. um, which is this really intense scene, especially for his character, Ben. But Jacob is like provoking him and kind of egging him on in this way that's really interesting. Um, what do you remember about filming that scene? I'll tell you, I have a very distinct memory. Um because I, I had never really watched Michael Emerson work before, right? And, you know, every actor has different ways of rehearsing. You know, I sort of walk through stuff and then gradually sort of work my way into it. So we do we do what they call a blocking. They don't even do a blocking mm-hmm. rehearsal. They call us to the set and they're like, let's just read these words. Let's just say these words to each other. So there's no pressure on anybody. 
And right out of the frickin' box, he's doing this brilliant speech, fully emotionalized, <laughs> right in my in my face. Like uh, you could have filmed that right there. Uh, and I was like, "Holy shit, this is intimidating!" Because it was like one of my first times on the set, so uh, I, I got to meet. Straight up, you know, somebody who worked uh, very seriously from second one. Uh, it wasn't even about warming up. He was already warm and in the mm. mode. And uh, and I remember being very moved by him, you know. Um, and I tried to let that be just part of the scene. Uh, he made he emotionalized me because he was so betrayed. Mm. He was he he felt he it was like watching a son. Uh, you know, a son talk about, you know, his father who was never there, who he gave everything to. And that really, really, uh, really touched me, even though I'm trying to get him to do something to me. You know, um, it touched me. His pain touched me. So you say you're trying yeah. to get him to do something. So th this was one of my one of my questions that I feel differently about every time I watch that scene. Do you do you want to stop him or do you really want him to, to stab you to death? I mean, what what do you think Jacob is actually doing there? I think I, th I think that has to happen. I think the yeah. death has to happen for it to go the places where it needs to go, for Jacob to have the power to communicate to everybody the way he does. That's just my own take. So I do think he was picking a fight. I do think I do think he was doing that. Uh, and and the dynamic for me, from what I remember, uh, that was fun to act was how much Michael made me feel about him and his sorrow while I was picking the fight. Mm. Um, so I thought it, it was a contradiction that was sort of fun to, to be in in the moment. I didn't plan it that way. It just sort of happened based on what he was doing. I like that. that. That helps me understand the scene, honestly, because when, you know, when he asks, what about me? What was so wrong with me? And you, you just look at him and say, what about you? I mean, clearly it's, you know, you're, um, you know, you're twisting the knife into him, as it were, before he twists the knife into you. But, <laughs> but then once, once he stabs and you fall, you know, into him, like you do look quite startled. Like it, like it actually does look emotionally very painful to you to have to, to have to go through with that. Sucks to die. <laughs> yeah, it sucks to die. But I mean, you know, and I don't even know if that was if I'm reflecting what was going on in the moment, you know, or if this is right. just my memory of it, I don't, I don't know. And I don't know if Jack would say the same thing. Was Jack directing that one? Yeah, he was. I, I think was Jack sure. directed that one. And I don't know if he would say that, you know, I don't know if, if his interpretation would be that way. Jack, you know, Jack, like any, any good director sort of lets you just be and find your way. And every once in a while, they might throw it, something out there to you. And with, with Jacob, it was really like seeing what sticks, you know, I, I don't know, you, you, you know, because the character is so mysterious, you know, and, and I, I just would try, I just tried to stick to the scenes telling me this, this is what's happening, this is what I'll do, and let's see what happens out of that. And the rest of the mystery was just, so I wasn't, I just figured you guys would do that work for me, you know, watching it, you knew the mystery more than I did. I just know what the moment is. That's one of the great things about Lost is you can have about 12 different interpretations for anything. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, not a lot and of shows all, like that, but Lost is one of them. It's probably yeah. all valid. Yeah. yeah. One, one thing I noticed rewatching a bunch of your scenes, um, <clears> including <throat> that one, is like, you know, when, you, when they first come into the giant foot where you're waiting, you know, waiting for them in there, um, I assume you didn't really film it in a giant foot, but you know, as you, as you see on the screen, right. you live at the bottom of the statue. You're in a rocking chair and you're kind of hunched over and kind of, you know, steepling your fingers a little bit. And then I saw there were a few examples of it, like in the sixth season when you're talking to, to Jorge Reyes in the temple, you're kind of hunched over by the edge of this pool, kind of... Um, I don't know. I just I, I wondered if there was something physical, like some kind of physical affectation you were trying to bring, because there were just a bunch of moments where you were like, kind of hunched and brooding, and you know, almost I don't want to say like not quite golem like, but it was it was a little interesting. You weren't just standing up straight, you know, looking at people. Um, uh, not consciously, I, and okay. I couldn't tell you what was going on at the moment that inspired me to do that. Um, but I I just sort of. 
you know, a, a, <clears throat> when, normally when I work on a part, especially one that has such a deep history like that, I, 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 I do a lot of imagination work, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, journaling and fantasizing and, th and thinking about things. And, and this one was a lot more free form and sort of in the moment and letting, letting the moment take me wherever it did. There might have been a lot of takes where I wasn't doing that at all. And they, they might have thought that was whatever was in that scene uh, made more sense to them. Yeah. I don't even remember that scene. I'd have to I don't remember it. The, the second one that I referenced was in the, in the sixth season, and you were appearing as a ghost to Hurley and sort of guiding him on this mission to go to the lighthouse. Yeah. Um, yeah, which happens a few times, I think, if I recall correctly. Yeah. All, I mean, all of you. I, I assume, by the way, that once they killed you at the end of the fifth season, you probably figured that was it, right? I mean, I, I imagine they didn't tell you you'd be coming back as a ghost all those times. I think I knew that I was going to be in. Uh, I, I knew I was going to be in a certain number of episodes, so oh, I knew okay. that I was I was going to be at the end of the fifth season and then the last season. Interesting. Yeah, it doesn't always work out that way, but yeah. Um, there was a scene that you filmed with uh, with Zuleika Robinson, who plays the character Ilana, where she's in a in a hospital bed, and you're telling her you need her help. I uh, spoke Russian in that, right? That's right. You yeah. spoke actually you spoke Russian and spoke yeah, a wide Co variety of languages and Korean in that uh, that episode. Oh boy, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I take it you don't speak Russian or, or Korean. Anymore. Don't speak Russian or Korean, um, so I was nervous. But go ahead, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, the only question was maybe that that character um, Zule Zuleika Robinson's character Ilana. I think that was the only scene you shared with her. She, she was she was a, a, a regular cast in the sixth season, and there was there was all this. Um, speculation about who she was and what she was doing there and it, it never really got explored I, I think she said at one point that she was supposed to be your daughter but that that never never came out on screen do you do you have any recollection of anyone talking with you about that character or her being your daughter or anything like that none interesting none. but i do remember getting my russian tapes and my korean tapes and having to <laughs> le learn that dialogue um, well, Dan Daniel Day Kim says you speak excellent Korean. On, on the he's show. very, he's very kind, <laughs> um, and and luckily I had him uh, uh, guiding me um, because I was like, look, guys, I'm nervous as heck because I, I think fans got at him because he didn't speak fluent Korean, right? But um, mm. Sun did. Was her character named Sun? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sun yes. played by you. She, you she spoke perfect, flawless Korean. So I was like looking at her, like you know, just bear with me and I, I let's just pray to God we get through this okay <laughs> and it's it was <laughs> it was a little nerve-wracking you know because I had to give them a blessing in Korean and it was like a page a page and a half of dialogue in Korean <laughs> oh, and um I'd never done anything like that before so it was a little scary and, and Daniel was just really really supportive he's he's really the one of the nicest guys I mean um you know because when you're coming on to a set uh even for a character that is becomes established in a way you're coming on to a set where people have been on the show five years you know yeah. they're, they're 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 very comfortable with everybody they're working with and every once in a while you get a guy like daniel who's and they were all very accommodating and very nice but you get somebody who goes out of his way to to just make you feel at home and you know and that's what when you're a series regular it's sort of important that you do that because a person coming on for a short time is they just have that little moment, you know, and you have all these years that you've built up sympathy and love from your fan base. And these people are just coming in for a brief amount of time. And, and that makes it that adds a little something to the work that makes it difficult. So I really appreciated him being supportive. Yeah. One of the other actors who you work with a great deal on the show is Nestor Carbonell, who played Richard. Um, they're sort of there's at least one whole episode where we sort of get Richard's backstory, hundreds of years of it. Uh, and Jacob is present throughout that episode. What do you remember about working with Nestor or uh, kind of creating that relationship that spanned uh, centuries? He's uh, he's like a tre tremendous athlete because I had to throw him around on the beach, and he took yeah. all yeah. The, he took all <laughs> the falls like a judo guy. Like he and I, I, I think he wrestled or something, and that's how he knew how to do it. But he was he was really physically adept and, and very much much better than I at that stuff and um and very very serious I also remember the scene with the wine 
we mm-hmm. did we did this long take where they had a tracking shot behind him. It had a, they had uh, uh, tracks behind him, and the camera sort of going off of his back and onto me, and going back and forth like this. And uh, but it always has him sort of in frame when it, but, but it's on my angle. And we did this great scene, and they say cut and. They're like, well, we have to go again. I was like, why? That was fantastic. Nestor had a had a praying mantis on the back of his head that was about that. It was the biggest <laughs> praying mantis I'd ever seen. And it was there through the entire scene. I didn't see it until he turned around and it was <laughs> sitting there. Um, and uh, what do I remember about the, amazing. the, the uh, uh, essence of the scene? Um, I mean, I'm sort of explaining to him the dynamic of the island and I'm sort of bringing mm-hmm. him into... If I remember, uh, yeah, it's almost like you're hiring him to do yeah, your, to yeah, do Jacob's bidding. That's yeah. what it is. It's like I want him to be the intermediary between me yeah. and other people. Like he's he's the Christ, I'm the God, and he he's the intermediary that deals with with people. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I remember that scene, and I remember his how tragic his story was. And, yeah. And how he thought he was in hell, and if I was the devil, and ironically, I was playing the devil at the same time in another show called Supernatural. So yes. Oh, yeah. When he would ask me, he's like, "Are you the devil?" I, I inside, I'd be like, "I am." Um, <laughs> but but I, I just uh, it sort of made me laugh internally. Um, yeah. So I, I yeah. mean, I re- I remember this just the nuts and bolts of the scene of convincing him to be my you know helper, so to yeah. speak. Yeah. So I think one of the things that Mark says here is is really the, the heart of what we've been talking about, right? He says, Jacob saw his life as a cog, a tool for this wider purpose. Like, Jacob's being used by the island too, right? He's mm. in service to something as well, even though he is calling the shots. Like, he... And whether he actually is sort of receiving messages or, or whatever, I don't know that that particularly matters because he believes he's in service of this, you know, gr- I hesitate to use the word greater good because is it good? I don't know, but in service of this greater purpose. And that's what's sort of guiding his decisions. Yeah, I, I really liked the comment that he made um, about himself and the man in black and how their mother was a fanatic. And he says, one's a convert, the other's a rebel. Mm. Um, and I, I think that, you know, you know, those are sort of two sides of the same coin here. I mean, neither of them is coming from a neutral place, right? right. I mean, you know, they're, they're both fanatics in in their own way, and I think that that I think that that speaks to what you're saying here. That he's he's taken this upon himself. He sees it as you know, his his life is you know as a, as a tool. He thinks this is his destiny, but he you know he's made that choice, right? I mean, right. just as John Locke does in the first three seasons. In, indeed. Just as yeah. John Locke does. I also enjoyed uh, talking about Richard. He's the Christ, I'm the God. I thought that was such a good mm. metaphor. Yes. But Jacob does see himself as a God. He really does. Yeah, he does. And and as we're going to learn next year, that's, I mean, that's an origin story that he's kind of created for himself with help from his mother. Yeah. Yeah. I also want to call out the fact that Mark and Titus Welliver, who played the Man in Black, used to hang out at P.F. Chang's. <laughs> um, if you remember when we spoke to Francois Chow, uh, who played Pierre Chang way back in season two, I believe, um, one of the notes, one of the things he wrote into Pierre Chang's origin story was that after he left the Dharma initiative, he moved to the United States and opened a, uh, an American Chinese restaurant called PF Chang's. <laughs> I forgot about that. That's so great. I think about that all the time. That's so weird. People ought to go back and uh, listen to that conversation we did with him in season two. And also, since we're talking with about her this week, by the way, Fanula Flanagan, who plays Miss Hawking, we had on the show earlier this season. Um, but, you know, the Dr. Chang stuff, we, we kind of got lost in our, our you know, philosoph- philosophy debate back there. But um, some great scenes with him this week. I loved his interactions with, with Faraday. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting here that Chang's first reaction is to think he's messing with him. Like, he thinks that, you know, Daniel was down in the mine and overheard him saying something about time travel and is now just, like, fucking with him. Like, do people in the Dharma Initiative do this? And this goes back to your point about this being, like, a very strange group of people. Like, who would do that? Who would say, like, oh, this is your son. I'm from the future. 
isn't that weird that his name is Miles? Like, I don't know, man. That seems like not a very good joke. No, I'm 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 with you. I, I, I it speaks to the just sort of like general tomfoolery and shenanigans that are <laughs> happening all over Dharma all the time. Indeed. Um. No, I mean, when Faraday drops on him, Miles is your son, it's just like, man, this guy is just blowing shit up. Like, yep. we've spent this whole time trying so hard to hide everything, and Faraday just shows up off the sub and is like, I'm from the future. Miles is your son. It's so fun to watch. <laughs> Some of the things I love about this episode. Um, I also, by the way, talking about Dharma shenanigans and tomfoolery, um, Stuart Radzinski in this episode now has goons with guns and mm-hmm. pretty much stages a coup of, you know, Dharma's military, I would say, by by capturing Sawyer. And, you know, by the end of this season, I, I think he's arguably, you know, done a coup on the whole Dharma initiative and takes over for Horus. Um, mm-hmm. get, gets back to that listener who called about the fascinating Dharma leadership dynamics. <laughs> and I, I think that's, that's very much on display this week um, and also gives... Radzinski, the opportunity, as we discussed with Eric Lang, to shout the amazing line. What the hell's going on? I just got shot by a physicist. Which is one of the great lines of, of Lost. <laughs> it is. And it's funny that, you know, as we see Radzinski ascendant in these last couple episodes, um, he, he is the person who is sort of maybe has like the purest belief in what the Dharma Initiative is trying to do. Like his whole devotion to protecting the secrets of the station that they're building when Saeed is captive and his devotion to, you know, how, why is Hurley here? He can't be back here. These things are secret and they're too important. Like he kind of seems to be the only person who cares very much about that stuff um, and is enforcing it from a place of like belief rather than, oh, this is I'm just doing my job or whatever. Um mm. And maybe that's why Radzinski is the guy who ends up down in the hatch. I, I was going to say the same thing. We, I remember we theorized back when we were talking with Eric about how maybe he felt guilt about what happened. But I, yeah. I think this is an equally compelling, if not more so, explanation that he was just such a fanatic that he felt like this has to happen and nobody can be entrusted with it but me. Right. Hmm. Stu. Talking about leadership, one one comment that I just meant to bring up earlier when we were chatting about Juliet, Sawyer once again this week just shows what an incredible leadership figure he has become. I mean, mm-hmm. as as this beautiful life he's built is just completely falling Humble. apart around him, like, yes, eventually he's gonna take his anger out on Jack, but but for now, you know, he's he's you know, sits them all down, leads the meeting and you know, just tells them the facts. All right, people, party's over. I know y'all just showed up. The rest of us have been here for the past three years. This is our home. The last thing I want to do is leave, but we ain't got no choice. And I'm just thinking if I'm Sawyer in this moment, I'm just going to be so incredibly pissed off at these people for coming back and fucking shit up that I'm going to be in no position to be sitting and, and you know trying to lead the making of smart, logical, sound decisions. Like, I'm going to be, you know yelling at and I'm not I don't think I would resort to physical violence myself because I'm not that type of person but I'm kind of amazed that he's not you know like punching them all in the face here instead he's, he's sitting them down and trying to figure out what can we do now what do we have to do next it's so impressive yeah. that he's able to handle it in this way yeah and and we know based on his his later actions as you say that he's he is pissed at Jack and company for coming back and messing up that this this nice life that they built I think Sawyer very happily would have lived many years in the Dharma Initiative with Juliet if he had been, if he had had the opportunity. And yeah, it sucks. But you're right. It, he he rises to the moment and says, no time for that now. You know, our mm-hmm. sort of immediate problem is that Phil is tied up in the closet and um, Daniel Faraday's back for some reason and is saying all this shit. And you know, clearly we have to leave. It's just a matter of how. Yeah. yeah. Faraday in the closet. Faraday. Phil in the closet is also low key hilarious this whole episode. But <laughs> <laughs> Jack, Phil. Phil, Jack. Oh boy. It's a great episode. It's such a great episode. Am I, am I crazy for thinking it's as good as it is? Am I overestimating it or did you love it too? No, it's it's great. It's really, 
really, really well written, if I may say so myself, not being a TV writer. I mean, there are just little – I talked about this a little bit just with – the, how Daniel's monologue sets up the end of the season, but there's also just the bits about, you know, the episode opens with Penny in the hospital and you're like, oh yeah, Desmond got shot. <laughs> What's happening with that? And then Eloise shows up and it it all builds very nicely. And then at the end of the episode, they return to that and you get this nice moment of like, oh, thank God, at least Desmond's okay. Um and every time Desmond and Penny are on screen together, I like tear up. I it cannot be helped. Um, and they get this really nice reunion. And you know, Desmond says, you know, I I said I would never leave you, and all that. And you do get to be like, oh, at least somebody is happy. Yep. You know, the construction of that is brilliant. How they open and close with those characters. Yeah, it's really nice. It's really brilliant. And by the way, you mentioned the writing. I, I checked because I said I would look this up earlier. Uh, the incident was unsurprisingly written by Damon and Carlton, and this episode was written by Eddie Kitsis and Adam Horowitz. Mm. Um, so that doesn't necessarily disprove your theory that those two lines that I quoted might have been crafted by the same person, but at the very least, those weren't the, the names of the writers on the episodes were different. Ah. Yes, you seem, you seem so uh, wowed by that. That's great. Uh, <laughs> we will be back next week uh, with Follow the Leader. Um, no centric, real centric character in that episode. I think Lostpedia kind of categorizes it as a Richard centric mm-hmm. episode, which I've always had questions about. But regardless, we will be back with Mark Pellegrino and, and more from our conversation about Jacob. As Sammy mentioned earlier, much discussion in this episode. If you would like to leave us a hot take about these subjects or any others, you can give us a call at 9546 Dharma. We're also on Facebook at facebook.com slash the hatch podcast and on Twitter at the hatch podcast. We love it when you rate and review us on your podcast app of choice. Uh, please uh, give us a rating. Let us know what you think of the show. Our theme music is by Andy G. Cohen and our cover art is by Danny Roth. And we will be back next week. Namaste. Namaste.